so rich and free. Amen. Before we get into Galatians, turn to Psalm 130. I told you the folks to show up a little bit early. Go to Psalm 130. I just need to clear something up from this morning. I quoted a passage. I was off by a couple, which means oh. I'm off. I'm sorry, sir, I didn't hear you over there. Psalm 130. He's a mean one, Mr. Mains. <laughs> Aaron Mains. Hey, that's, that now, now we're getting somewhere. Aaron Mains. I quoted Psalm 130. The quotation, thank the Lord, was right, but the reference was wrong, and that makes it wrong. Psalm 130, verse number 3 says, If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. It's verses 3 and 4, not 5 and 6. I need to clear that up because I do not want to misrepresent the Lord nor give you improper Bible verses, especially if you write them down. You're like, what is this idiot doing anyway? Galatians chapter 1, which you already know the answer to that. So Galatians chapter 1, please. Last week we left off on the oppositions that come our way. Galatia was getting hit with oppositions. It didn't take four or five verses in the book of Galatians, and people are messing with these folks, these saved folks, where they're getting another gospel, a perverted gospel, and folks are coming in and troubling them and messing around with them. And then you read on further down the line, when we get further in the book, you're going to find out that Galatia, the Galatian believers thought, well, maybe we just work harder. Maybe we do more for the Lord. Maybe we hand out more tracts or give more to missionaries. And the Lord's like, you're saved by grace through faith. You receive the Spirit by grace through faith. That's the way you're kept. You want to serve because you love me, not because you're forced to. And you're not adding anything to me. You're not adding to your spirituality with your works. Even though works are important, we covered that a few weeks ago. But they're not what makes you spiritual. And Galatians struggled with that. Look at the Bible says in the verse number one, Paul an apostle, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Now, verse, go back to verse one of the Corinthians, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Thank you, Father, again for the night. We've already had singing songs about your son. There's no songs about Buddha, Muhammad, Allah, or a pope, a preacher, a pastor. None of them can stack up to our Savior. Thank you for the true God and eternal life, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Thank you that your grace was greater than our sin. Thank you for the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross. And thank you for saving our souls. Father, if, if that's all we have in life, please help me personally to count that as the very best thing I could ever have, just the saving of my soul. The rest of this world is going to hell in a handbasket, Father. You said so. We just read it. Help us just to be thankful for saving our souls and that we've got something to do to try and get some other folks in the boat before you come back. We thank you and praise you, Father, for the night. Thank you for these folks that came out. Pray your blessing now upon our time in Christ's name. Amen. Last week we left off, Brother Pete left off reading 3rd John about Diotrephes. We were studying and going through in verse number uh, 7, talking about the gospel, which is not another, referring to the gospel from verse 6. But there be some that trouble you. I want to hit a couple spots tonight if we can. So 1 Corinthians 11, I want to finish up. In 1 Corinthians 11, uh, Brother P, if you can pick it up in verse number 18 and 19, we'll go around the room again. 1 Corinthians 11, let's, let the folks get there and we'll read it. I want to wrap up some more Bible about folks that trouble you and your belief in Jesus Christ. Uh, trouble for the believer, even Old Testament saints, has been as old as day one. We should not think ourselves exempt. Brother Pete, go ahead. Get me uh, 1 Corinthians 11, please. Okay. Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. So first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must, also, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be manifest amongst you. 
Thank you. The Bible says very clearly in 1 Corinthians 11, this is one of the craziest verses you can ever read in your Bible, where God, through the our apostle, the apostle Paul says, you're going to have to have heresies in the church. There has to be people that teach you're going through the tribulation period, you're post-millennial, you're on-millennial. You have to have folks that say that you need to speak in tongues to be saved. You need to have folks around that say, yeah, I'm not so sure about eternal security. That stuff has to happen in the church. Why? Because God enjoys false doctrine and leaven? No. So that they which are approved might be made manifest among you. How do you get approved to God after you're saved? Study to show thyself approved. You know why God lets heresies in an assembly? So those who have been studying their Bible, have been taught the Bible, have researched on their own, have hid these things in their heart, have put them into practice. So guess what? God says, go take care of that. Handle that. Uh, somebody in your church preaching some false stupidity, go confront them one-on-one. -on -one. They don't listen, take somebody else with you. After two admonitions, what are you supposed to do in Titus chapter 3? Reject. You reject them. After two admonitions, he's done. Don't put up with them, don't tolerate them. Get them out of that congregation, get them out of that assembly. It would save you and will save you headaches down the road. But once you get rid of one, be sure there'll be another one. I mean, Diotrephes was in third, John. We haven't gone to it yet, but you've got Hymenaeus and Philes. You've got Alexander the coppersmith. When Paul's writing his last words to his preacher, Timothy, his preacher boy, he says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And what does he say after that? Of whom be thou where also. He withstood my words, and Timothy, I'm telling you, he's going to withstand your words. There's always going to be a coppersmith named Alexander in your congregation, somewhere, somehow. You can ferret it out and do the best you can as a preacher, and you should, but you're always going to have somebody in there that's got some bad doctrine, in fact, some heretical doctrine. I'm not talking about who you think the sons of God are. I'm talking about some stuff that can mess other Christians up. Blood atonement. Uh, uh, well, King James Bible is just our preferred version. You know, and that stuff gets in there. I'm telling you what, man, it usually starts like this. I've uh, been around for a little bit. It usually starts with the music first. Music will go bonkers, and then dress code goes downhill. I don't care what you wear. I'm just saying that it just gets a relaxed attitude where you start wearing, you know, shorts and flip-flops in the church with no care or concern to come to church at least the best you possibly can for your Savior, not for the preacher, but for, you know, the Savior that bought you. And then it'll go to the Bible versions, and then the teaching will get watered down. Before you know it, it's the river or it's, what, what's another word they call now? Community. You know, whatever. It used to be a King James Bible believing church. Now it's just a not a wreck. Uh, you think some of the churches that have been around over the days, I don't know if you folks know Beecham Vic out in, uh, back in the 60s and 70s, that man, the Lord allowed that man to have thousands of thousands of church members. You know what's there at Detroit Temple Baptist now? Nothing. You can go up and down this whole country of Bible-believing churches and they all started with just a little crack and now they're gone. There's got to be heresies. That's part of what Galatians is going through. There's some bad doctrine, because you know how you know that? In those verses we just read, somebody's perverting the gospel of Jesus Christ we studied this morning in Sunday school. Somebody's tweaking it and taking it and perverting it just enough to cause other believers trouble. That's a bad thing to go through. Uh, Karen, 1 Thessalonians 3. 1 Thessalonians 3, please. 1 Thessalonians 3. Karen, if you can read verses 1 through 5, please. 1 Thessalonians 3, 1 through 5. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, a minister of God, and a fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith, that no man should be moved by these afflictions, for yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, Why would the Apostle Paul have to send Timotheus back to establish people and comfort them? Because of verse number three, you're going to face afflictions, and sometimes those afflictions wipe Christians out. I, they don't lose their salvation. I'm talking about they wipe them out of the assembly of believers, the fellowship of believers. 
they're here, they're, they, it, folks, it happens, and you can't control what life comes your way, but sometimes you need another Christian along to keep you from being hindered and pushed and pulled aside. But I want to bring your attention to verse number five. Guess who shows up amongst the afflictions, folks? The tempter. The tempter in verse five. You do know the devil's real, right? I'm not being facetious or rhetorical, and it is kind of rhetorical, but the devil's real. If you think he doesn't know we're meeting here at 47 Main Street, you're crazy. If you don't think he doesn't know what you do on a daily basis, you're crazy. It may not be the devil himself, but it's one of his little 168th ranked little gnat flying around you. And he knows what trips your trigger, buddy. And he knows what gets me too. He knows the sin which doth easy beset me. It just so happens... It'll be right there. Years ago, there was a guy, a guy uh, Guido knows him very well. His name, was, uh, his name is Paul Fink. Paul Fink had just got out of alcohol rehab. I've told the story before. And his testimony, and from what I understand from people around it, it was true. Paul Fink had got out of an alcohol rehab, and he was within two hours of getting on the program. He was released on his own recognizance, didn't have a place to stay. He was going to go down to the rescue mission. And guess what was on the corner of the street as he was walking down? cooler full of his favorite beer on ice. Now, whether he's lying, I don't know whether or not. I mean, you say, well, that's pretty crazy. What do you think Paul did? He drank it. I wouldn't do that. You have no idea what you do in the flesh. Yeah. You have no idea. I'm saying to you, the tempter is real. And just when you think you got victory over one thing, eh, there might be something else right around the corner waiting for you. Just be on guard about that. The tempter is active in Thessalonica. And that's part of what's going on with some people, some troubling. It's not just other folks that trouble you. The devil will trouble you. Are you telling me when you get down to pray, you haven't had that creeping sensation up the back of your neck that says you ain't really saved? Why are you even praying? He doesn't hear you. I don't know. I'm just, I, maybe I've watched too many horror movies. That's happened to me more than once, man. It's not just you freaking out. It's actually the devil saying, whispering those things in your ears, that voice. Uh, he, he doesn't care about you. Oh, yeah, well, you're safe, but he's abandoning you. Look at the pain you're in. Look at what your wife's going through. Look at your kids. Look at all the, you, you're going to pray to that God? I'm telling you, man, that stuff is, and the, he's the tempter. He's not the sinner. He doesn't make you sin, but he'll throw that nice, that nice shiny thing right in your way. That'll trouble you. That'll trouble you. Haley, I need you to get 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I need you to read verses 1 through 10, please. 2 Thessalonians 1 through 10, please. Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians in God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith grows exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you yes. all for each other about it. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. That's just what you saw over the afflictions and stuff in chapter 1, uh, uh, 1 Thessalonians 3. Same same thing. Still going on. Keep going. Which is a manifest token of the righteous, righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Saying it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation. Them that trouble you. What did the Apostle Paul say over Galatians? People trouble them. What does the Bible say right here? There's people troubling you. But you know why they come up too? That God can show how righteous he is and how he defends his kids when he smacks those fools down on your behalf. You know what? Uh, I like those little bumper stickers sometimes you see that say, uh, you know, uh, my kids are whatever, whatever. I, I saw one one time that said, my dad can beat up your dad. Well, my dad can beat up the devil anytime he wants. In fact, he already whooped him at the cross. And so when these things come, resist the devil in the power of God. Humble yourselves and take that victory. Keep on going. Hail. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe in that day, because our testimony among you was believed. You know what will get you through some of the trouble when you get troubled by other folks? 
particularly lost folks, that God's going to settle all the scores one day. Did, did you read the context of that? It's an evident token of what you're going through that God one day will recompense judgment and wrath in flaming fire taking vengeance on them. No, not God. I don't, we don't walk around like that today where God's going to get you if you don't get saved. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, man, you better get saved because when he comes back, and this is the second coming context, when he comes back, you're on the wrong side. You're in trouble, buddy. You're in big, big trouble. That gets tucked away in your head like, man, one day God's going to settle all the scores, and I'm not going to get it right down here. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Our God's a consuming fire. There are times where I wish I was like James and Sean to the Lord in Luke 9. Lord, would you have us do like Elias did and call down fire from heaven and smack these guys? And the Lord goes, what is wrong with you? I didn't come to destroy men's lives with the same that's our attitude now, but back in my mind, I'm like, man, you better get saved because one day the Lord is going to settle the score with everyone. But it's his vengeance. He has a way of doing that that you and I can't partake the right way. We're all partial in that because we all, we all have people that we'd like to see get a little more punishment than other people. But this one says right here, they trouble you. They trouble you. They trouble you. What does Galatia go through? People troubling them, giving them a hard time. Folks, the point of this being, as we're going through the book of Galatians, is you're going to have trouble in your life. From outside, from inside, your own self, from the devil. You guys got to fasten your mind and steal your mind to this book that, man, this life is not pleasant to go through. And there's pain and sickness and torment and stuff. But I know where I'm going and I know whom I believe. And one day it's going to be over. It's hard to see when you're laid up in a bed. I get it. Oh boy, what a great promise. What a great promise. Go on with me. Taylor, I need you to get 1 Timothy 8 and 1. 1 Timothy 1, please. 1 Timothy chapter 1. The Lord always names names, folks. He doesn't say, well, that person over there, whatever. No, he names names. 1 Timothy 1, 17, Taylor, to the end of the chapter, please. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. Yep. Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. Of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. There's two people named by name right there, and guess what the Lord says? You better avoid them because they'll make your faith a shipwreck. You know, where you're sailing along in life and you already have enough storms and winds and contrary waves and things against you. And then here come some folks and guess what they want to do? They don't just want to see you go through the storm. They want to see you wrecked. You say, oh, that's not like that. Oh, sure there are. There are people that are envious, jealous, bitter, mean, and they want to see your life a shipwreck because they don't have the relationship with Jesus Christ you do. Uh, folks, it's in the Bible. I'm not reading some foreign spy novel thriller. It's in the Word of God. This stuff is happening to the apostle and his preacher boy. And he says, you better look out because there's folks out there that will trouble you. And they won't just trouble you now. They want to wreck your life. Can't take your salvation, but boy, they can give you a messed up testimony and report the judgment seat of Christ. Folks are out there. You say, wow, that's a pretty cynical view. It's a Bible view. You can be happy and joyous in the Lord, but... You need to walk around circumspectly as he taught you to. Always with an eye looking around as a good soldier. Because what's the verses before that that Taylor read? That thou mightest war a good what? Warfare. You're in a war, folks. Whether you like it or not. You've been conscripted, buddy. You've been drafted. You're in the war. It's a spiritual war. Brother Darren Mays, I need you to get 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy, chapter number 2. Pick it up in verse uh, 15, if you could, brother, and go down through 18. Actually, 19 would be, 15 through 19 would be really good. <clears throat> Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain battles, for they will increase in the more ungodliness. And the word will eat that doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who, concerning the truth, have erred, 
saying that the resurrection is, already, is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand assured, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that name the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Amen. You know how God just answered your question about whether you're going through the tribulation period or not? Verse number 19. God knows who you are. You're his son. You're his child. You're getting out of here before you miss the resurrection that those guys are promoting in verse number 18. The Lord knoweth them that are his. He sealed you folks into the day of redemption. He knows you're his child and you're in the book of life. And because of that, you're not going to miss the resurrection, which what... Folks, you know why, two, why we, we quote 215 and we should quote 215? Studies show thyself approved because there's always going to be somebody around that tries to trick you out of not rightly dividing your Bible. Yeah. There'll always be somebody around that wants to, you to err from your faith. Oh, uh, uh, Brother Pete, did you hear this new one? Uh, we're going 21 months into the tribulation period. No, the Bible says I'm getting out of here because my Savior loves me and came for me and redeemed me from all iniquity, and I'm going up with him before it all starts. Well, yeah, yeah, you're doing exactly what two guys did 2,000 years ago. Just as they want to blame that the, the rapture theory is from the 1800s, well, you've been promoting post-millennialism for 2,000 years. Who are you trying to kid? But they're around. But that's your heresy doctrine from 1 Corinthians 11 19. You're always going to have somebody around that has, hey, brother, have you ever seen this in the Old of the Bible? I'm not talking about something cool the Lord shows you when you read your Bible. I'm not talking about that. Or maybe the Lord answered a prayer for you when you read your Bible. I'm, I'm talking about, hey, brother, did you know that uh, there's 14 angels that are, what? You know, coming up with something that God doesn't even know about. I have a new, I have a new doctrine today. Well, does it match all the consistency of Scripture with all the other lines? Well, no, it's kind of something nobody's ever thought of. Exactly. See you later. I'm not talking about something you don't know that a brother comes up and says, hey, what do you think about this? I run some crazy stuff by people. Make sure I'm not getting too far left and too far right. Hey, am I reading this right or am I reading it wrong? You're reading it wrong because there's another verse. Thanks. Correct me with that. But you've got some guys right here that are actually causing a problem. So now you realize why 2 Timothy 2.15 is so important. Because if you don't rightly divide the word of God, it not just ruins your doctrine. But did you read what uh, you hear what Brother Darren read in verse 16? What else does it do when you don't rightly divide your Bible in verse 16? What's it lead unto? <laughs> you, know what, you know what not rightly dividing your Bible does? It helps you lead an ungodly life. Or you just think you're smart and you know all the dispensations. No, I'm just trying to keep my head out of the filth of this world. And it helps to know where I fit in God's plan by rightly dividing it so I can avoid that foolishness. This is off, this is off, the, this is off the trail, but it's good. This is a freebie. Brother Darren, you don't have to put anything extra in the, in the tithe box. The tithe box, that's fine. 1 Corinthians 14, I want to I read this to you, then we'll go back, we'll get back on track. First, First Corinthians 14, please, if you could. <laughs> These are the, I, again, when folks find something cool, and they, I, I think it's neat. But it's those guys always come and say, you know what? I, I, you know what? I found out that there are really aliens in King Cut's tomb, and I can show you a verse on it. Really? What, what's that got to do with getting a prayer answered from? You know, I mean, anyway. Well, look at 14:26 with me. 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If you found something in your Bible that God doesn't even know about and it doesn't edify another brother in Christ, keep it to yourself. Because the Corinthians are struggling with not just the man fornicating with his stepmom and I'm of Paul and I'm out of Apollos. They're not they're struggling with people coming into the assembly going, uh, preacher, I got something to say to you. Did you ever see this before? Oh, I've got a psalm and oh I've got a doctor and I've got a, I've got a revelation. That church is messed up. It sounds like a lot like the Laodicean churches we see nowadays. Everybody thinks they have something to say from the Bible. If it's rooted and grounded in the truth, have at it, man. Have at it. But if it's not, you better be careful you're not going down the road of these two clowns in Second Timothy. Chapter 2 that Brother Darren read. Justice, can I trust you to read a Bible verse for me, brother? Where? 2 Timothy 4. 2 Timothy 4, please. And Silas, I'm going to have you read one too, please. 
I'll get, I'll get you Silas in a minute. Uh, Justice, I need you to read 2 Timothy 4, uh, verse number 9 through 16, please. Actually, 17 would be good, please. Thessalonica. Thessalonica. Mm -hmm. Crescens. Crescens to Galatia. Yeah, you got Crescens it. Crescens to Galatia. Titus unto Dalmatia. Mm -hmm. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with me, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. And Titus have I sent to Ephesus. Eph Ephesus. Ephesus. Yep. The cloak that I left it. Alexander still has a bad reputation, and he says, Timothy, beware of them also. There's always been enemies and people troubling other believers. There's always been false doctrine and false belief. You know what the Apostle Paul said? Only Luke is with me. You think about the churches in Galatia, the churches in Corinth, the church at Rome. You think of the thousands of saved people that Paul ministered to, that he led to Christ and then ministered to. You think about the hundreds of people that he worked with his own hands, as Acts chapter 20 says, where he would make a tent or use his skills to pay his bills and the bills of other people. You think about the money he gave away to help, and he says, you know, you know who's with me in Rome? One guy, Luke. After all those hundreds, all those thousands of churches and brethren and people, there's only one guy that stuck with me. But you know what he says that's encouraging at the end? The Lord was with me. The Lord will not leave. And then what he says is he goes, I don't care if nobody's going to preach around me. I'll keep preaching. Did you read that? Brother Justice just read. He just read that over in verse number 17. He goes, you know why? It says, not with saying the Lord stood with me. Why? And strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known. It doesn't matter if nobody else is going to preach the Bible. I'll keep preaching it. It doesn't matter what other people say. Shut up. I don't want to hear it. I'm going to keep preaching it by the grace of God. Because the Lord's the one that strengthens you to do that. You look at some of those Old Testament men, Jeremiah, what did he go up against? Ezekiel, Hosea. You think about what some of those Old Testament preachers went through. Are you kidding me? And the New Testament preacher's like, eh, that's a shut it down. Nah, no Sunday night. Nah, no Wednesday. Now, you may have to do that just because of the way the circumstances are. I'm talking in general. People don't want to preach this book and folks don't want to listen to it. I don't know what it is, man. Well, I know what it is. It's a famine for the hearing of the words of the Lord. And you're not even in the tribulation period yet. Silas, I need you to get this over in Titus chapter 1. Can you do this for me, please? Mm -hmm. Chapter 7. I, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse. Yeah, chapter 7 would be a miracle, wouldn't it? That'd be some heresy right in the assembly. Uh, first, uh, Titus chapter 1, 7 through 14, please. Yeah, he's not that that's his proclivity, his bent is not towards dirty money. But a lover of hospitality, a, a lover of good men, sober, just holy, just holy, temper, temperate, mm -hmm. holy, holding fast to the faithful word as he has been taught, that he may be able that you may be able by sound doctrine both to
That would be the Jews, yep. Whose mouths must be stopped, whose food is subverted, their houses, teaching things which they ought not, but what they do to be saved. One, one of themselves, being a prophet of them, said, The Cretans aren't always liars, even evil beasts. Thank you. This is going on when Titus, Titus is going to take over the church of the Cretans. He's going to be the preacher there, like Timothy's going to be the one at Ephesus. And the Apostle Paul says, you're going to have some folks that are going to trouble you. They're of a circumcision. We looked at that last week. How many times Paul and Silas, Paul and Bar, they preach and who shows up to subvert them? Jews, unbelieving Jews, mocking, disparaging, blaspheming, causing an uproar, trying to get them locked up. All kinds of trouble while they're trying to preach God's word. What I'm trying to say to you folks is that if Galatia went through it, and Thessalonica went through it, and these guys went through it, you're going to go through it. You will face opposition in your life, and there will be people that trouble you regarding the ministry and the preaching of this book. Well, I'm a female. I don't preach. You do by your life, and you do by your witness with your words. You do. And you'll get trouble, too. Remember this, folks. The woman is the weaker vessel, not because she's stupid. That's not what we're talking about. It's she's the weaker vessel, but she's given more to spiritual things than men are. That's why the devil went after her. Knuckleheads over there, he just willingly says, yeah, I'll do it, baby. I'm going to do it for you because I love you and all that stuff. But she's like, she entertains the conversation because she's a con conversant being. And she got to a talk with the devil and got... I subtly got deceived, and that was the end of it. But women do have the ability to be a good witness for Jesus Christ in areas where I'm not. And you got to be careful. You can be troubled as well, ladies. Well, that's just the preacher and the men. Oh, no. Trouble comes to everybody that's saved. We have an adversary of the devil. You've got other brethren, unfortunately, do argue and fight against you. And you got the lost that go against you. Brother Pete, I need you to get 2 Peter. Please, 2 Peter chapter 3. Last one in this vein, and we'll go back to, uh, go back to Galatians. 2 Peter, please, and get chapter 3. <clears throat> if you could read uh, 15 through the end of the chapter, Brother Pete. 315. An account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, mm -hmm. as also in all his epistles. Speaking in them of things, these things, and which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures under their own instruction. Mm. Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware yes, ye also, being led away with the air of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness, to grow in grace Amen. and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus. Christ. Amen. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. <laughs> That's pretty heavy duty stuff. Simon Peter says, you better get those writings the Apostle Paul wrote down. Because if you don't get those situated, you're going to have trouble with the other ones. In fact, you're going to arrest them to your own destruction. Didn't say you're not saved. It just said you're going to have a problem when it comes to that Bible if you don't get those Pauline epistles down because there's things hard to be understood in there. But it's going to be the key way to the other parts of your Bible if you do get that right. Now, that being said, Brother Pete read something very interesting in verse 17. He says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before, beware lest ye also, being led away with the air of the wickedness, fall from your what? Your own steadfastness, it can wreck you personally like the shipwreck in Timothy and your own uh, ungodliness in 2 Timothy 2. Not getting that Bible right is not a matter of you answering Bible questions. We like doing that. It's not a matter of you knowing everything there is to know in the Bible. But he did say at the end of it, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You need that to get you through the tough times in life. You need that to believe in when you're facing critical things that come up, and you need that when folks come up and challenge you about what you believe, so you don't fall from your own steadfastness. 
And you don't get involved in an ungodly lifestyle because you don't know what you believe. I think there's a lot of saved folks that, I said it last week, I think there's a lot of saved folks in the Kingdom Hall. I think there's a lot of saved folks still in the Catholic Church. You say, well, what would they be doing there? Nobody grabbed them and taught them the way of the Word of God. Now that they are saved, who am I? What am I? What do I do? Where do I go? Who do I hang around? I don't have any excuse for the way I behaved for almost three years from 1984 to 1987, but no one discipled me after my Lord led me, uh, after my brother led me to the Lord. And that's, I, there's, please hear me, there's no excuse for the way I behaved. Zero. But somebody came along and said, I'd like to start meeting with you. And I'd like to start taking to church, and I'd like to start taking to the detention center. I liked it. And somebody took me and rooted and grounded me in that book and said, now that you're saved, this is the way we walk. Really? Well, when I got to Pro Ball, you know what they handed me? They handed me a, a book called The Oriole Way. And that book told me how to cover bases as a pitcher, what we did for bunt defense, what bases to back up on first and third, second. What we had to do as a pitcher, where I was expected to go and where the ball was going to come and what cutoff was going to hit. And it was called, it's the, here it is. Here's how we do things. Why don't we do that in Christianity? You guys have it when you work. You have a manual. You have ways of being trained and taught of how to do your job. If it's a good company you work for, you have standard operating procedures. That's what you have. Well, so don't we. It's called the authorized version. And the problem is folks do get saved and they really get converted to Christ and nobody's around to teach them how to have some steadfastness and what's going on in their Christian life. I think discipleship is missing sorely in our, Christ, in, our, in our Christian world, if you will. We're good at getting them saved. We're good at getting them into church, but where's that one-on-one -on -one connection between the pulpit and the pew? It needs to be a man that's been trained who can say, Preacher, I got this guy. I'll check in with you every once in a while like they did with the Lord. And this is what I've been teaching. This is what I've been training him, and we got it under control. That's the way God built this thing. Multiplication, not addition. Go back with me to Galatians chapter 1, please. Galatians chapter 1. So not only were they troubled, if that wasn't fun enough in the book of Galatians, look at the Bible says in verse number... Look at verse number 6, please. Galatians 1, 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ... Unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, I didn't do this on Sunday morning. I'm doing it for Sunday night regarding the gospel we preach today. The gospel we preach, this, this is a little bit of class interaction. Where's the gospel we preach today? The gospel that we preach today. Where's that gospel found? 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. It's the gospel. That's the gospel we preach today. Okay. Now, we've been going through the different Gospels on Sunday morning because that's where we are in the doctrinal statement where we lead to eternal security. But I want to show you some cool stuff tonight. I think it's cool. Of what God calls our Gospel besides 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. But it's what we preach and what is involved in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Go with me. Go right, we'll go right around the Karen. I need you at Acts 20. We're, we're just going to go around the room. We'll, 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 we'll get these out. I'll, I'll save perverting the Gospel for next week and some other stuff. Acts chapter 20, please. This is pretty neat how the Lord does this. I was reading through and I'm like, man, there's a lot of names for the gospel we preach today. Found, as you guys correctly said, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Karen, can you read uh, 20? And start verse 17, please, and go through 24. And from my Wow. I fear unto myself, 
so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. That's name number one. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4 is our gospel, but what does the Lord specifically call it? As Paul is closing out his ministry to the Ephesians before he gets in a boat and sails, what's he called at the end of verse number, sails away, what's he called in the end of verse 24? The gospel of the what? The grace of God. You say, well, the grace of God's always been evident, not the grace that saves the blood of Jesus Christ. You know that from John chapter 1 where it says the law was given by who? Moses, but what? Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Are you telling me there was no grace before? Of course there is. We looked at it all through Sunday school. There's grace before the law, under the law, uh, 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 millennial kingdom. There's grace all through your Bible. But the saving grace where the blood of a sinless man, the Lamb of God, applied to an individual sinner, that's called the gospel of the grace of God. And look who's presenting it. The Apostle Paul as he's about to get on that ship and sail away gospel of the grace of God. That's title number one. Romans chapter one with me, please. Romans chapter one. Haley, you good to go? Okay, Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one, I need you to read uh, verses one, one through nine, please. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated unto the gospel of God, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name, among whom are ye also the call of Jesus Christ, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Yeah. The faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. For God is my witness, whom I, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of the Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayer. you got to reverse that. Make me Please. request if by any means now at length I might have a prosperous journey by the will of God to come unto you. Two, two other names. Verse number one, Haley read it. You read it kind of quick because you're like your father, the devil. Uh, separate unto the gospel of who? Gospel of God. Now, who's presenting that? The Apostle Paul. Go over here to verse number 9. What's it called in verse number 9, folks? For God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of where? His son. His son. He's not perverting, but he's saying that there's names. I'm, I'm getting to where it's be perverted. Well, we're not going to get to it tonight. But I want to lay some groundwork as our gospel is called the gospel of the great. It's 1 Corinthians, Brother Pete and others said, it's 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. But God gives it other names throughout the Pauline epistles and through the Apostle Paul. And it's pretty neat how he does that. Haley, I need you to give me one more. Verse 16, please. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. What's it called, verse number 16, folks? The gospel of who? It's the gospel of Christ. It's the gospel of his son in verse 9. And it's the gospel of God in verse number 1. Pretty neat little three right there. Taylor, I need you to get chapter 2, please. Uh, Taylor, can you read 2, 12? Oh, man. 12 through 20. 12 through 20. Romans 2, 12 through 20. You guys got, I brought you guys pens. You should be ready to go, man. Yeah. I know, man. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Can I, can I, they're just making sure they, one person doesn't get one more verse than the other. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, we went over this on a Tuesday, so I got pre notes. No, you didn't, Kenny. I texted you, text you late in the morning. Go ahead. For as many as have sinned without law shall also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these, having not the law, are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile excuse, accusing or else excusing one another. Real quick, you have an Old Testament example of this. Who would that Old Testament example be of the Gentile conscience? Do you guys remember him? You guys remember him off the top of your grape? Abraham. Close. It's right, it's right there. It's Abimelech. Who, remember Abraham shows up with Sarah, and Abraham says, ah, uh, that's my sister. And Abimelech goes, uh, 
well, I want to, if that's your sister, then can I date her? And then God appears in a vision, and Abimelech says, I knew something was crazy here. That's a Gentile using his conscience. God gives Gentiles conscience. What did he have to do for the Jew? Every man has a conscience. I, 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 I might understand that. But those Jews needed that thing written down on both sides of two stones. Whereas God gave Gentiles their conscience. It's the right context, Brother Pete. It's Abraham and his wife. It happens actually before that, too, because they're playing the game. And, and Isaac does the same thing. It's hilarious how this played. Not hilarious, but it just shows you that a dog returns to his vomit, and you pick up stuff from your dad and you didn't think you were going to pick up. Keep on going, Taylor, please. We're going to get to another name for the gospel, the grace of God, or the gospel of 1 Corinthians 15. In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel, behold, thou art called a Jew, and we in the law? No, rest. No, rest. Okay. No, like rest. You re yeah. because you call yourself a Jew and you rest in the law. Oh, I've got the law. I'm a Jew. I, I've got the law. What do you have, Gentile? Well, I have a conscience. Well, you both negate or don't do what those things say. You're in trouble. The Jew rests in the law. Whereas a Gentile says, I got my conscience. Keep on going. Yeah, rest. rest is, I, when the first time I read that, I'm like, Lord, is that reset? What are you doing here? Yeah. Rest is in the law. And maketh thy boast of God, and knoweth his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law. There you go. And art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a ah. light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which hath the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. The scary thing is they had it, they wouldn't share with anybody. We can instruct babes. We're teachers. We know everything. We're God's chosen people, and they wouldn't do anything with it. How, Jesus Christ confronts them in John 6, 7, and 8. He says, how, you've got the law, but none of you keep it. But you're bragging about it. But did you see what the Lord snuck in there in verse number 16, folks? In the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to what? Okay, now I, I need to clarify this because I'm going to get some hate mail from the right over here for being Paul only. But it's not his gospel. He didn't invent it. But it was given to him by revelation in Galatians chapter 1 in those years in Arabia with the Lord. Because there's no way he could have known that. Just like there's no way the Apostle Paul could have known about the Lord's Supper. When he says, in that night the Lord took the cup. Paul, you weren't there. You weren't even converted yet. Yeah, but I had three years of uh, Bible training out in the desert with the Lord personally. And I didn't confer with flesh and blood once I, I didn't have to. He trained me. So my gospel doesn't mean that Paul sat down and said, you know what would you know what would be a good way for folks to get saved now? Um, Christ died for our sins according to the script. No, the Lord gave him that gospel. Right. But it's associated with the Pauline epistles. And what we read this morning in 1 Peter, you see how Peter's theology changed after Acts 2, where Christ once died for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being quickened by the Spirit. Death, burial, and resurrection for our sins. Peter doesn't have all that down in Acts 2.38, folks. Just be careful when you read it, that's all. You got the Holy Ghost in Acts 2.38 as a Jew for recognizing you murdered your Messiah. Repent and be baptized every morning for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know how you get the Holy Ghost now? The day you trust Jesus Christ and you take that gospel. You don't have to get in any water. That's my gospel. He, he, doesn't, he didn't invent it, is where I'm going with this. Brother Maynes, can you get 2 Corinthians, please? 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. Bear with me a little, my folly. We will get through this. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, please. Uh, can you read 10? Through 13, please, Darren. 2 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13, please. To whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Mm. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, and, door, and a door was opened unto me. 
of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit, because mm -hmm. I found not Titus my brother. But taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Amen. What's, what's the title here for 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, verse 12? Christ's gospel. So now, instead of people going off your rocker and saying, oh, that's Paul and, you know, you're hyper. No, you just had Bible clarification when Paul says, my gospel, it's Christ's gospel given to him to preach. Specifically to what group of people? The Gentiles. Justice, I need you to get Ephesians chapter 1, please. Ephesians chapter 1, please. For where we're at, Justice, can you read verses 13, please, and 14? Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Whom also, oh, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, after, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of God. Amen. Which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. What's, what's, the, what's the gospel title here in verse 13? The gospel of what? You better believe it, man. That's the go When you talk to somebody about being saved in the salvation of the Lord, you're talking about the redemption of their soul for the penalty he paid for their sins on the cross. I don't, I'm not, I don't strain at a gnat and swallow a camel when I ask people to say the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15 when they say death, burial, resurrection, death, burial, and they say it so quickly. You gotta get the Bible specific where he died for our sins. Because Lazarus died, was buried, and rose again. Jesus Christ did what he did specifically to pay for the sins of mankind. And that's why it's such good tidings. I don't have to die my sins and go to hell. Somebody took it for me. And the Bible says right there, it's the gospel of your salvation. You say salvation to an Old Testament Jew. What are we getting delivered from the uh, Hittites today? Uh, did we find water out of a rock? Are we getting out of Egypt? No, the salvation today is the rescue of your soul from a devil's hell. I'll take that one. Because you know what happened to a lot of those folks that died in the wilderness? They went to hell. I'll take the gospel of our salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ any day of the week. Silas, I need to get chapter, same book, chapter 16, chapter 6. Same book, chapter 6, please. I need you to read verses 10 through 16, please. Ephesians 6, 10 through 16. Our Bible term right here is found in verse number 15, the gospel of peace. That will take you back to Ephesians chapter 2. Jesus Christ is our peace. He is the peace who makes the peace with God between a sinner and a holy God. You know why we read this morning where we, where we preached out of 2 Corinthians 5? The ministry of reconciliation is between folks that are at odds with one another. God is at odds with me because of my sin. I have no right to be at odds with him. He's done nothing wrong. And what we do as saved people in the New Testament is we try to reconcile people back to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. We want them to make peace with God through the blood of his son. Uh, folks don't understand how horrible it is that God looks down at them right now and doesn't even recognize them. He has 
He has nothing but looking down and going, I don't know who you are, and uh, honestly, you're my enemy, and I'm at odds with you because of your sin, and then somebody comes along, a child of God, a saved person, a witness to him, and they get saved, and they go instantaneously from being an enemy to a son. Instantaneously. Darkness to light, power of Satan unto God. You leave Satan's family, you join God's family by grace through faith. You make peace with God through the blood of his son. Ephesians 2 is huge. For, you know what? Because it also shows you that he takes a Jew and a Gentile the same way now. He, he broke down the middle wall of partition and he makes both a Jew and a Gentile a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ through that shed blood. And it's called, right? You just read it, the gospel of peace that we're trying to bring to a lost world. We're not trying to make peace with the world and the countries and everybody just get along and everything like that. No, we want you to have peace individually with a holy God who hates sin. And he'll only do it to you and with you through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. That's the gospel of peace. Brother Pete, for, uh, 2 Thessalonians, please. 2 Thessalonians. We were here just a minute ago. Brother Pete, I need you to read, if you could, um, I know. I know. We just read. I don't want to. I don't want to chew my cut again. Can you read, uh, brother? Pete, can you read five through eight? First, uh, Second Thessalonians one five through eight, please. Which is a manifest token of the righteousness, righteous judgment of God, that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us, mm -hmm. when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord, and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints, and to be admired Amen. in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed. Perfect. What's the Bible called the gospel we preach in verse number 8? The gospel of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. So we've had the gospel of God, the gospel of his son, the gospel of peace, our, uh, uh, my gospel. We, we've had a ton of them. The gospel of your salvation, the gospel of the grace of God, and they're all linked to us preaching how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That these verses all hinge off of 1 Corinthians. We say, why are you doing this, preacher? Because in Galatia, they're taking the simplicity of the gospel, somebody is, and they're perverting it so that believers in Galatia and those churches in Galatia are getting messed up. And folks, when you get messed up and don't preach the right gospel, you can get people eternally hosed. We'll look at that when we get on down. I'm sorry, sir. Uh, Philippians uh, 127 is the way of life, the gospel of Christ. It's the way of life. So, I mean, right. It, Galatia, they're having a problem because people are troubling them, and they're messing with the message of the gospel of life, eternal life, of Jesus Christ. Folks, it is a simple thing that we offer people. It's a simple thing that God offers people today in this day and age. You will never get an easier gospel than today. And yet it seems like people are getting crispier and harder and more stiff-necked and hard-hearted to it. And this is the, Brother Pete just read it. When that trump sounds, you know what happens to all the people that didn't believe the gospel of the grace of God? You're done. You're cooked. If you think you're going to have the faith in Jesus and keep the commandments of God in the tribulation period, believe the gospel of the kingdom, when you didn't take it now by grace through faith, when it's the easiest it'll ever be, you're crazy. Not biblically going to happen. While you're right here in 2 Thessalonians, Karen, I need you to get, while you're right here in 2 Thessalonians, talking about when God destroys, Jesus Christ destroys the Antichrist. Cannot wait for that day. Uh, can you read chapter 2, Karen, verses 11? Through 14, please. Second Thessalonians 2, 11, uh, yeah, 11 through 14. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you for salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto we called you by our gospel, to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
what, 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 what's, what's the uh, First Corinthians gospel called here, folks, in verse 14? It's what we preach, save people, New Testament Christians and saints. It's not my gospel, even though it's called my gospel. It's called Christ's gospel. But it's the gospel we preach as New Testament Christians. It's our gospel God gave to us. Go preach it. Go hand on a gospel track to somebody. Give them a Bible. Show them where the gospel is. That's important, man. If the battle was going on back in Galatia that people were perverting the gospel, what do you think's going on now? I don't know if you guys, uh, you get involved, you're probably better off not seeing it or reading it. But people don't believe you need to repent anymore. I brought up in Sunday school to be saved. That's, that's, repentance is not in the gospel. I, I'm fully aware of that. I'm not, a, I'm not a repentance, saved salvation preacher. You get saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that's it. But you will not take that free gift unless you realize you're the sinner that God says you are, and you turn. And now they're not preaching repentance at all. It's just belief. Yes, it is just belief. Once you get to the point where I need a savior because I'm in trouble. But you ain't going to get there without that repented heart, repented mind. Just, just a little, you know, it's belief, you know, there's no repentance there. I understand there's no repentance, 1 Corinthians 15, but what you did is you just perverted that way of salvation. So now people, you know how many, you know how many people generically believe in Jesus? I did that as a lost Catholic. You know where they're headed when they die? Hell. Because they didn't have that repentance that led them to saying, I believe in my heart that God raised me from the dead and I confess with my mouth. Save me. Big difference, man. Big difference. There's a lot of folks that have a head knowledge and they have no heart knowledge at all and they won't confess it with their mouth. Um, 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Haley, 1 Timothy chapter number 1, please. I have... Two more. Oh, you know what? Did I miss Ken and Estee? I have. I've gone. I've met. You know what? I gotta get the favorite couple of the year. <laughs> I, I'm so. I, I, can't, I went right. I went to all my favorite friends around the outside ring. <laughs> we were just. Close. I know we were. <laughs> I know that. Close. Man, we were so close, man. No, I'm gonna. And now. We're going to Chronicles, Ken. <laughs> First Timothy, First Timothy, chapter number one. The gospel out of the Chronicles. No, I mean, I'll, yeah, I, we could. Have. <laughs> oh man, First Timothy, chapter one. Man, I can't, I went around you guys twice. What? Wow, man. Great circle. Yeah, I mean, yeah. That sounds like my prayers finally got answered. <laughs> First Timothy, chapter number one, brother Kenny, can you read? Um, oh wow. Can you go verse 5, please, through 11? Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. unfeigned. What's it mean if you're unfeigned? Yeah. Not if, fake. Bingo. Sincere, genuine. One of my favorite words of all time is disingenuous means you're phony as a three dollar bill if you're unfeigned that means you're the real deal buddy yeah, in other words it's faith on faith you're not faking in what you believe because you've putting feet to what you believe keep on going from which some have some having swigger it's what you did on 84 yeah. swerve. swerve man i have turned aside unto vain jagging Pain jangling. Jangle. Uh, without getting into it, you go back to Isaiah, that's, you know, the women have all the crazy bells and that, you know, all the, the noisemakers and all that stuff, and it just turns you aside and you get, you get suckered into that noise instead of the truth of the root of the matter. You get, you're getting pulled in by, look, let's look at the distraction, but not, let's not look at the core. And it's all window dressing. What's really at the core? The vain jangling, man. Oh, yeah. You read about the wimples and the crisping pins and all that stuff. Desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither <laughs> what they say nor what of they are. Nor where they're for. They don't even know what they're talking about, but they're, it's vain jangling. And they're phonies. Keep on going. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. 
knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, mm. for the ungodly and for the sinners, for, un for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, yeah. for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, mm -hmm. for man-stealers, for liars, for perjury. 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 What, what's it mean if you perjure yourself in a court of law in particular? What's it mean if you perjure yourself? You guys, you basically, you've indemnified yourself through lying. Yeah. You, you've actually, yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, man. And if they be, and any, if there be, yeah. if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, here we go. According to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, mm. which was com commanded, committed, committed, committed to my trust. Look at verse number eleven, folks. The Bible says the glorious gospel of the blessed God. That turns over right over Romans one, the gospel of God. Right here, he calls it the gospel of the blessed God, Pauline epistle. I'm saying to you that good time, this, this 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, where we started, it's got a bunch of different names. You say, what's, what's the, where are we at? They're trying to pervert it and change it. When God just gave you 10, 15 names for it, and you've got people fighting and perverting it in the book of Galatia, trying to mess believers up. Sister Estiana. Mm-mm-mm. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. 2 Timothy chapter number 2. Verses 1 through 9, please. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the thing that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, Amen. and shall be able to teach others also. Amen. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that war is entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Here's that warfare. And if a man also strive for mastery, yet is not crowned, except he strive lawfully. Mm. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruit. Consider what I say, and the Lord give me understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evil doer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Amen. Again, my gospel, and what's the, the Lord, the Holy Ghost, throw in there? He was raised from the dead. So it's all it's all ascribed to that gospel from 1 Corinthians 15, 3, where Brother Pete, Brother Darren, as you guys mentioned, the gospel we preach today. That's under attack. And it's been under attack for a couple thousand years. The Apostle Paul says, man, I see this as, he says, it's my gospel. I see it even a little further where it becomes personal to him because of the salvation that he enjoyed as a law-keeping Pharisee. Mm -hmm. And he got freed from that. And he went from darkness to light. And God saved his soul as a religious lost man who was the best Pharisee they had to that you could ever offer as a Pharisee, the Apostle Paul. And he says, man, that's my gospel. That's the one that saved me. That's the one that will save you if you'll take it. I, I have a personal affection and affinity for that gospel. It is my gospel. It's the gospel that converted my soul. I hope you feel that way about the gospel. It's a wonderful thing, man. God forgave me and for, has forgiven me of all my sins for all eternity blood of his son Jesus Christ. Not through anything I did but through what his son did for me. And that's just a rundown tonight. We covered a couple different things uh, regarding those of trouble. We finished that and then all the different terminology for our gospel we preach from 1 Corinthians 15 3 and 4. Brother Pete, can you pray for us tonight so we can close? Appreciate you coming out. I do. It's a blessing, man. Well, God, thank you that we can yet still hear and have the gospel teach here. It's not a lot of places not allowed. Yeah. Taught underground, Lord. And I pray for those Christians now that are suffering or persecuted underground, Lord. Amen. Amen. All those uh, communist countries and the influence that they have even here, Lord, that they want to shut the gospel down. Mm -hmm. Lord, we know that your word tells us that uh, we're winding things up here now. We're watching things going on on the world scene. And, uh, 
we have the assurance that you're in control 100 percent Lord. You've done all these things before, all this prophecy that's been brought to pass in this book, everything that's prophesied for the future, Lord, is going to come to pass for you. So we would pray that we would have our conversation, our way of life, according to the gospel of your dear son, Jesus Christ, who saved us, Lord. And I thank you for his word, the word that you printed for us in this King James Bible, Lord, and preserved it and kept it. Yes. And that we might be pleasing to you, Lord, and we might have hope, eternal hope, in those things that aren't seen, Lord. Thank you through the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen, amen, amen.